doesn't. Can everybody see the, the title screen? It's on the presentation. Excellent. Okay. Cool. So yeah, so um, so I'm going to talk today a bit about uh, superconducting magnets and basically the, the path to fusion energy that we have, um, you know, here at, at MIT and, and Commonwealth and actually with quite a lot of collaborators around the world, including Berkeley. Um, so yeah, so the, the talk is kind of um, the talk is kind of set up as uh, there's a little bit about fusion, uh, just in general, like how how fusion works, and then I'm going to talk a bit about the the work that we've done, and then some of the collaborations we have. So, dive into it. Here we go. So, um, I think this one doesn't really need that much explanation, but decarbonization is going to you know be one of the largest macro trends this century. It's something that has to be done. I mean, COP26 is going on right now. Um, this you know. The, the way that things are going, uh, you know, this is this is the largest story in the world. If you look at basically any type of news outlet, and it's just growing. And basically, we're going to have to do what it takes uh, to get to decarbonization, no matter whether it's fusion or something else. Um, and so, this is going to require a really big shift in the way that we generate and consume energy. And so, currently, you know, the energy market is something, you know, it's something like five to six percent of the entire world's GDP. Um, which is kind of a crazy number when you measure in you know percent of world's GDP as opposed to trillions of dollars even. Um, and so if you were to plot out uh, you know how much energy we're using right now, and this is actually just electricity, um, and you know and you plot you you plot where we're going, um, you kind of get to that we uh, we're going to need some wedge here in the like late 2030s um, and onward, we're going to need something in this wedge to displace coal and natural gas if we want to get to these, you know, um, you know, to these megatons and gigatons of carbon reductions. And so this is basically, you know, order of 100 gigawatts of power plants per year required in order to do this. And so, you know, we sort of see this as this is both the largest problem, but also a big opportunity facing humanity. Um, and, you know, our perspective, um, is that you know innovation at the source is really the highest leverage way to get there. I think you know I think definitely we are we are big fans of you know a a wide range of uh, a wide range of different types of renewables. Um, I think it's going to take. There's not going to be one silver bullet that gets us there, um, but we think that you know fusion could actually be a big part of this. And so why why do we think that? Um, so what actually even independent of fusion, what wouldn't sort of an ideal energy source look like if you could just make something up. Um, you would want something that didn't have emissions. You'd want it arriving as fast as possible. You'd want it to be deployable and replicable. You want it to be really power dense um, if possible and not have any barriers to really scaling it quickly. So, you know, it's, it's one of these things where the faster we can deploy this, the better. So manufacturable, not a lot of land use, not a lot of material inputs, use existing supply chains that you have, existing procurement channels, and if you can, reuse existing infrastructure. And so we think that fusion actually satisfies a lot of those things. Um, it, it's not currently satisfying the speed portion, but that's what we're working on right now. Um, and so what is fusion? Fusion, you know, at its most basic level, it's the process that happens in stars um, like the sun. In stars, you generally are fusing hydrogen together um, to release, you know, to release helium and enormous amounts of energy. Um, and basically, because you're breaking nuclear bonds um, or um, putting nuclear bonds together, you're actually generating about 200 million times the energy per reaction as burning coal, where you're breaking electronic bonds. Oops, wrong direction. So this is um, uh, so this actually isn't. Uh, what goes on inside of a star, but on Earth, uh, we, we want to take isotopes of hydrogen. So deuterium, which is the one on the top, and tritium, which is the one on the bottom. You fuse them together, and then you get two products that come out. You get helium and a neutron, and actually you get more energy. Um, you convert a little bit of mass into energy, quite a lot of energy that comes out uh, in the energy of the neutron and the helium nucleus. And so why is this so disruptive? I think this is a really good picture to, to show why. So this is a picture of um, one of the largest oil tankers that exists in the world today. And so if you were to take all the water that's displaced by this tanker and filter the deuterium out, deuterium is naturally existing as like one part per 6,000 in seawater. 
Um, if you were, so you to filter that water and then fuse it, you would actually, uh, you would basically generate as much energy as all of the oil that's in the tanker. And you would do that while you're protecting the environment. Um, and so this is why we see fusion is really disruptive is that there's, there's no carbon emissions. The fuel supply is basically water. Uh, you can build it anywhere, it's dispatchable. There's no you know, meltdown problems that you would have or long live nuclear waste. And there's no um, fissile material proliferation. Um, so we really think this can be civilization scale energy. And so, you know, digging in a little more because it's a science talk. Um, so I'll talk a bit sort of programmatically about what we've done later on in the talk, but, you know, going through what, what would fusion actually look like? So this is kind of a cartoon, um, but what you really want to do is you want to take a star and you want to get that star down on earth. And so the way there's a couple different ways that you can do that, but um, the way that we're doing it is in this device called a tokamak, which is basically a big magnetic bottle. So um, you have these D-shaped magnets. Um, I don't know how visible my cursor is, but I'm kind of circling around uh, these D-shaped magnets in the device that basically create a confining field for a plasma that's kind of a donut-shaped or toroidally-shaped plasma. Um, and then after that, it's actually the actual power generation part of it. Um, you know, so you, you heat up a working fluid, um, which is like how a coal plant works, how a coal boiler works. And then you would pump that through a turbine and then a generator, and then you make electricity. So actually the, even though the method of producing heat is quite novel in this case, and you know, very sort of sci-fi, the actual balance of plant is very similar to the balance of plant that exists in a lot of baseload power today, um, which is actually an advantage because we think that we could actually reuse quite a lot of that infrastructure that already exists. And so here's the reaction again, deuterium, tritium gives you a helium and a neutron. Um, when this happens, when you're confining something in a field, uh, the, the helium uh, nucleus, the alpha particle is charged. And because it's charged, it's confined by the magnetic field. And it basically goes back into keeping your, your mixture of deuterium and tritium hot. You have a very energetic alpha particle that bounces around inside of your um, inside of your plasma and it keeps things, um, it keeps things hot and fusing. The neutron on the other hand, because it's neutral, uh, is, does not feel the magnetic fields and flies out of the device and will bounce around inside of the blanket. And mostly it will, um, you know, mostly it will scatter off of particles inside the blanket. And so that's, you get heat from that, you know, you'll heat up the blanket material. This is a working fluid that you have sort of surrounding the chamber that has the plasma. And that's what gets heat exchanged into your turbine and generator. But there's also reactions inside of the blanket. Um, so you'll notice before I said deuterium is available in seawater. Tritium is not a naturally occurring isotope. Um, it has a half-life of about 13 years. And so you would actually breed tritium inside of the plant. So you'd want something inside of your blanket. You would, you would want uh, elements inside of your blanket, uh, namely lithium, um, that would allow you to have enough reactions so that you can breed enough of your fuel to basically pump back into the tokamak and keep things going. And so, like I said before, the helium nuclei transfer energy to the deuterium and tritium. Uh, and eventually the helium gets cold enough that it will either radiate photons or it will, um, it will collide um, with the walls of the device, the vacuum vessel, and effectively transfer their energy that way into, uh, into the working fluid in the blanket. So sort of the, the power balance of the system is satisfied that way. So you basically, you get all of your energy eventually comes out in some form of heat either through the neutrons or through the helium. And actually through the neutron collisions, um, since this is a nuclear group, um, through, you actually get a little bit of a bonus with the neutrons because a majority of the interactions, it, I guess it depends on what blanket material you choose, but the, the FLIB, which is the molten salt um, that we're considering, most of the reactions that you get are actually exothermic. So you actually get a little bonus inside of the blanket. Um, you, you get uh, you get extra energy generated by the, the reactions um, that we tritium uh, and, and other things. So the conditions for burning a plasma have been really well known for a long time, actually since 1955. Um, and it's actually kind of simple. You basically need, it's kind of like, you know, building, building a campfire. You need enough fuel density. So that's this end term here. So you need enough wood. You need to get the wood hot enough for a campfire. And plasma is quite, quite hotter than that. It's about hundred million degrees. Um, so the concept of temperature sort of sort of changes a bit from you know, conventionally what you think of as temperature. 
um, sort of naturally existing in the world. Um, and then you need energy confinement, which is basically how well insulated your plasma is from cooling down. So this is actually a really interesting thing about fusion plasmas is when people hear 100 million degrees, you know, you automatically think like, oh my gosh, like, you know, the, these magnetic fields are basically confining this lava that if, if you lose confinement, the lava is going to go and it's going to burn through everything it touches. And it's actually the other way around. The plasma is extremely delicate. So the density that you need is about a million times less dense than air. And so the plasma is actually extremely fragile, it turns out. And it's part of the reason why it's taken so long um, for, for fusion to mature as a technology is that you really have to get the conditions right to insulate it from its surroundings. Because as soon as you lose confinement on your plasma, it will touch its surroundings, whether it's a gas or a liquid or a solid that are all much, much denser than the plasma and all relatively much colder than the plasma. And it'll basically extinguish the plasma immediately. So from a, from a plant safety standpoint, this is a great thing because it means that if you know if you know something bad happens to your plant, um, and say you you break confinement in your plant, your plasma will go away immediately. Um, but it also means that it's you know the plasma is kind of finicky and it's really difficult uh, to get it to do what you want it to do. And so if you go back 50 years ago, the state of fusion, so this triple product, this density, temperature, and confinement time, sometimes represented in units of atmosphere seconds. Um, so DT breakeven, so Q is, um, is a term for the energy gain of the plasma itself. So, you know, it really depends on where you draw your box around energy out and energy in. But so from a, a, a physics, from a physics terminology, one of the big milestones is getting more energy out of the plasma and heat than it takes for heating energy into the plasma. That's kind of when you've achieved, uh, um, you know, that's sort of like the minimum viable condition to say, okay, fusion is, you know, is really relevant for a power plant. Of course, you know, can power conversion efficiency is not 100%, which means that, you know, you would, you would not have a Q of one power plant, you probably need like a Q of 10 for a power plant, because there's a whole bunch of, you know, recirculating power and efficiencies and the electricity conversion, but you're in the right ballpark, getting Q of one is a really, really big deal, because it, it means that you're, you know, you're basically in the right ballpark to have, a, to have a, a, a burning plasma. And so if you look at you know, where that is in atmosphere seconds, 50 years ago, we were really far away. It's a log plot. So we were like decades away, both in time uh, and in triple product from getting break even. So now, you know, so that was, we're about you know, 30,000 X away, right? So started building some more tokamaks around the world and actually increased. And if you'll notice, this is like, you know, this is pretty linear on, on a log lin plot. And so this is this is pretty fast rate of improvement. Um, it's kind of a somewhat uh, tired joke that fusion is 30 years away and always will be. Um, that, you know, it's, I've heard it a million times. And it's interesting because if you actually look in history, even so, you know, now we are about hundred times away, 40 years ago. If you look, it's, if you look all the way back to about 2000 even, we basically climbed up this curve really fast. Um, if you think about the, the parameter space that this is that this is going in, um, like this is basically the same pace as Moore's law climbing up this curve. And so, obvious question is, if we got here in 2000, then how come you know why aren't we powering this talk on fusion energy? You know, we're a factor of like 1.5x away to get to Q greater than one. And the reason is that what this plot doesn't capture is that the way that people got this performance is that they build bigger and bigger devices uh, for the most part. And the next device that was supposed to, you know, sort of cross this line is ITER. And ITER is a very, very large device. And even though it was conceived in the late eighties, it's still under construction right now. And it's not going to get a first plasma until, uh, you know, they're projecting 2025, and then it won't actually put tritium into the machine and get, you know, break-even plasmas until around 2035. So, you know, ITER is very large, very large things are very expensive, take a long time to build. And we looked at it in our, in our group at MIT and CFS and said, we said, is there another way to basically break out of this, you know, we kind of, there's kind of like a hockey stick curve here. There's really, really fast growth and then things leveled out and kind of asymptoting. So can we break out of that? What can we do? And so if you go back to, you know, what's important in, uh, in magnetically confined fusion, 
Um, turns out, unsurprisingly, the magnetic field is very important in magnetic confinement fusion. And in kind of two ways, one way you can look at it without, I, I won't dive deep into these equations, but if you look at energy gain, so like the triple product kind of goes as some dimensionless plasma physics parameters. So beta, H, Q star, um, and then R is the major radius of the device. That's kind of like the linear size of the device to effectively the first power and then B to the third power. So that's a big lever right there is that if you increase B by a fact, magnetic field by a factor of two, then the energy gain that you get out will increase by a factor of eight. Now, if you look at power density, there's some more dimensionless, you know, dimensionless scalings, beta, epsilon, the aspect ratio, um, and, and Q also goes as linear size. Now this one is times B to the power of four. And, you know, you can argue about, you know, this is, the, these are like, these are very heuristic definitions. So, um, but the fact is, is that, that B is, uh, is a very, very strong lever, no matter how you look at it. And it makes sense. Basically, the, the way that physically I think about it is that you have this plasma, the way that the, the, way that the, the magnetic field works to confine the plasma is that you, you have these field lines going the long way around the donut in the torus. And at, um, when a charged particle, it wants to spiral around these field lines. And if there were no collisions at all, your particles would be confined forever. But of course, in a real system, there's turbulence and there's collisions and your particles inside of your plasma um, will actually jump field lines until they get to the end of the device. And so that is, that is loss of confinement, is basically losing energetic particles and you want to avoid that. And so one way you can avoid that is you can actually just make the device bigger. So it requires more hops for one of these particles to make it outside of confinement and hit the wall. The other way you can do it though, is if you increase the magnetic field, you will actually decrease the Larmor radius. And this is the radius at which the ions circle around the field lines. And so for the same size device, if you increase the field, then it will take more hops for the, for the particle to get out because the Larmor radius is decreased. And that's really fundamentally why having a higher magnetic field gives you huge wins as far as if you're trading off for the size of the device. So we looked at that and said, huh, you know, this is something that we do at MIT. I'm actually sitting at the PSFC right now, um, just, you know, a few hundred feet away from this machine actually. Um, and so this is, this was kind of like one of the um, general pathways that, that we had here at MIT for a very long time, actually, even before Alcator C mod, there was Alcator C and Alcator A, you know, all the way back to the sixties where the strategy was just really push hard on the field. And what they did is built really, really sophisticated copper coils. Um, and so this is, you know, this is a engineering drawing of, of CMOD. You can see these toroidal field coils. Here's the set pulled out of the CAD drawing. Um, these are more window, uh, window pane shaped um, as opposed to D-shaped. And you see there's this really big superstructure on the outside. There's kind of like an exoskeleton uh, on this tokamak. And that's because these you know, magnets at these fields, so at the magnet itself was about 16 Tesla. So on the plasma, it was about eight Tesla. Um, these magnets have an enormous amount of pressure on the magnets themselves because you're putting, you have a Lorentz force, you have current interacting with the magnetic field. The magnets basically want to expand. And so you have to, so the tokamak is basically with a really high, high field magnet, you're basically, you need to have a very strong structure to keep everything in place and keep, basically keep the thing from bending itself uh, into a pretzel. And so there's kind of, you know, if you look at the field, there's kind of a conundrum. So if you, uh, if you plot, you know, four quadrant, four quadrant plot where you have physics confidence and you have the size and cost of the device, either sort of fits in the quadrant where there's extremely high confidence on the physics. So the world has collectively built about 170 tokamaks um, and either is built on basically all of that research. So all, all of these tokamaks have operated in various regimes and various non-dimensional parameters and are, and are contributing to the physics basis behind ITER, which is very, very rigorously, been very rigorously looked at. And, um, and so ITER, you know, they're going up that curve, you know, I made, made it look easy on that graph, but like climbing up that curve, there was a lot of learning. People built devices that didn't work, people learned. There was entirely new realms of physics in plasma physics that were discovered um, getting there, but you know we're very, very close to um, to break even, 
And the extrapolation to eater is actually not very far from the machines that we have right now, except for the size. The size is, is massive. Um, you actually can't even really see. My cursor is about the size of a person. You can see a person in this figure for scale. Um, so really, really big. On the other hand, you know, we looked, you know, even starting about 20 years ago with TriAlpha, there were some startups that, um, you know, kind of in startup parlance, you know, called moonshot approaches that can be tried at small scale. So basically these were, these were concepts that had been looked at in the 60s, um, sort of by the academic community and the national labs and kind of, um, you know, kind of put to the side really in favor of Tokamax, which at the time had the highest performance. You know, some, there were some companies that went and took a look and said, hey, you know, the physics, there's still a large extrapolation to go in physics. We're starting basically where Tokamax started 40 years ago, but these machines that we can build are actually really small. So we can actually, we can climb that learning curve faster. And that was kind of the, the approach. And we said, well, it'd be really nice to do something with Tokamax where we already have high, high confidence in the physics, but also make Tokamax small enough to be fast and expensive and get more cycles of iteration in before we get to a power plant, which is what's needed. So if you plot the um, so this is, this is kind of a, this is a, a plot that is basically us trying to condense 60 years of research of tokamax. Um, so those 170 tokamax, kind of all of that goes into this heuristic plot. So this is the size and major radius um, of the device. And you can kind of group that into, into three regions. There's, if you're below two meter major radius, you're like at startup scale, sort of like two to four meter major radius. You're looking at like a traditional power plant. We've built a couple tokamaks that are in like three meter major radius uh, in the world. Um, above that, you're really looking at probably an uneconomic power plant. These are massive devices. So ITER, um, you know, ITER is a, uh, well, well, we'll plot that on this plot a little bit later. Um, but ITER, ITER is up in the uh, probably uneconomic range. Um, so these contours here are contours of, of fusion gain. So this is the plasma physics gain. So one is where we want to get to, you know, somewhere between five to 20 is kind of where we want a power plant to be. And then on the x-axis, of course, is magnetic field. Um, I should point out for the magnet people in the audience that this is the magnetic field on axis of the plasma, which means that the field, you can basically double this to say, what's the field that you, the maximum field on coil that you need to achieve this field on the plasma. Um, and so, if you look at, uh, so if you look at CMOD, Alcator CMOD had copper magnets and was able to get, you know, I was saying 16 Tesla on the coil and eight Tesla on the plasma, but those were not superconducting magnets. And if you were to try and build a plant out of copper magnets, you can, and there was actually, the US actually very seriously considered a design um, in the early 2000s called FIRE, which was basically a high field copper eater. Um, you can get, you, you could operate that, but it would require basically like a gigawatt uh, power plant next to your fusion device just to run the magnets. And so if you wanna run magnet steady state at really high field, you need to use, or any field really, you need to use superconductors. And the whole side of this plot is grayed out if you use sort of traditional low temperature superconductors like niobium titanium or niobium 310. Um, and so really, you know, up until recently, the magnet technology precluded operating in this space. It's not like the people who designed ITER said, well, we want to make a really big device. It's, they said, you know, no, in the 80s, the technology that existed was LTS. It was actually the state-of-the-art LTS, the Niobium 310, that was developed. And they said, okay, we're going to build the smallest device we can with kind of the maximum field that we can squeeze out of the current technology. And that's where ITER lived, a little bit to the left. Um, this is Q of, nominally a Q of 10. Um, and so, yeah, this is 90s magnet technology, um, and it's basically the smallest machine that would burn. And so CMOD, like I mentioned before, is in this gray space because uh, it got to the high field by having copper magnets, but you would never be able to build a power plant. You'd never be able to get, you know, economic break even using copper magnets. It would always take more electricity uh, to run the plant than you would get out of it. So what changed? And what changed is in... 1986, um, uh, there were some scientists at IBM that discovered this material called rare earth barium copper oxide, um, which is this so-called high temperature superconductor. Um, people were really excited about it, but it kind of existed in sort of like powder form um, up until like early 2000s when people started putting it in short lengths of, of wire or tape 
And then in the 2010s, there were several companies that started to emerge that were actually developing the technology, basically the thin film deposition technology to actually make lots of this stuff. Um, maybe, maybe lots is a strong word, but they were making enough of it that you could actually build serious magnets out of it. And so if you look at you know, magnets that, uh, that SUNAM has built and National High Field Magnet Lab has built, um, a bunch, you know, several of the national labs um, have, you know, like, like at, at Berkeley National Lab, um, at, at Brookhaven, um, people have built uh, high field magnets out of HTS because one of the things that separates HTS besides the temperature, so everybody focuses on the temperature because, you know, holy grail is room temperature superconductivity, and that's kind of the, the thing that makes headlines. But what we really care about is we care about the field and the LTS technology. If you plot, you know, kind of this, um, uh, if you have this like surface plot, of temperature, current density, so how much current you can stuff into a cross-sectional area um, of your wire and magnetic field. The LTS, basically you're confined to low temperature, low field and moderate current density. And HTS expands this in basically all areas. Um, and what we really care about is the high magnetic field. So theoretically, you, know, you could get HTS to operate at extremely high fields. And so people were building magnets out of this and you look at these magnets and this is you know this is kind of in in the 2010s um these are really serious magnets a 26 tesla that's really high field 32 tesla uh insert in uh in the middle of a bigger magnet um and we looked at this and said huh like you know these are you can see in the scale of the picture like here's a wrench these are sort of like bench top scale magnets like what if somebody built a fusion magnet out of this and so that's really what we set out to do so you know, we, we took this material and we used it to basically invent a new type of, of high field magnet technology. So, you know, it's not enough to just say, you know, take this and wrap it into a coil. There's a lot of structural loads. You have to make it robust to these things called quenches. Um, and so we basically spent the last few years developing, um, you know, building and breaking and building again, um, a whole bunch of different concepts for technology. And you know, so we, we developed several different types of magnet technologies that we think would be applicable to fusion. Um, so uh, some of them, uh, we've, we've published on some of them, we're in the process of publishing on some more, uh, applied for a couple patents on this stuff. Um, and we're already incorporating it into, actually into non-fusion products as well. So we're actually building some, um, some high field R&D magnets um, for a couple of university groups. Um, and things like that. But ultimately, you know, this, this is this technology, we developed it because we said, if, if we can make this technology work for fusion, we can open up the right side of that chart here, we're going to go back to um, our contours and say, you know, I don't know what happened here. This is, um, this should be shifted up. Um, but uh, if you look basically at fusion gain, now you you open up this contour at the small size that you would want to have sort of a traditional power plant size. And that's what arc is. So if you compare sort of the major radius of eater of six, arc around three, um, and you just change the magnet technology, it allows you to almost double the field uh, in, in arc. And what that allows you to do is with a much smaller device, you can actually match the same fusion power that eater would have and do it in the form factor of a device that has things like the blanket that could actually let you generate electricity. And so, um, so the next thing is you say, okay, well, this is still a traditional power plant, still costs a lot of money. And so instead of just jumping to ARC, what if you kind of, again, looking back to sort of like startups, what's the minimum viable product? And the minimum viable product is a device that we have called Spark. Um, and Spark basically takes, takes away the fusion blanket part of it and says, what if your, your first goal was instead of just getting, instead of putting watts on the grid, what if your first goal was just to demonstrate net fusion energy in a device that's as small and as cheap as possible? And so Spark is a, it's a compact high field. Um, so Q greater than two, it's designed to very conservatively hit Q greater than two, but if you actually use the same physics basis as ETER, um, you would get Q of about 11. Um, with a, at about 140 megawatts of fusion power. Um, and it's basically designed, um, it was designed effectively using the same physics, plasma physics basis as ITER, but swapping out the magnets with these HTS magnets. Um, and so 
you know, the toroidal field at the plasma on the center in Spark is about 12.2 Tesla, and the toroidal field on the coil at peak um, is a little over 20 Tesla. And so these magnets are much, much stronger um, than even the magnets that we would have in ARC. Um, so these are very, very high powered magnets. Um, and so this will basically access what's called the burning plasma regime. It's kind of a long pursued frontier in confined plasma science. Uh, and this is, like I mentioned before, this is a really key step in getting to a power plant. And we actually, we published this whole physics basis and put it in front of the fusion community. Um, and so, you know, there's a series of seven peer reviewed physics papers that we have out. They're actually open access, um, you know, available in literature in, in one of sort of the premier plasma physics journals that we put, you know, we put out to the community and said, please try to poke holes in the physics basis of this, because our whole approach is that we don't want to have to take physics break, don't want to have to make plasma physics breakthroughs. We really want to put all of sort of the risk into this magnet technology because, you know, at the time when we published these papers, we hadn't built this big magnet. And we said, you know, well, what we wanted people to say is that it will work if they can build the magnet. Um, and then we'll sort of prove out that we can build the magnet. Um, but we just, we wanted to basically get, um, get peer review on the plasma physics concept. So if you're interested in, you know, in looking at the papers, there's a, uh, there's a series of them that were published in the journal of plasma physics. Um, there were a few sort of uh, articles in the popular media about them. Um, and so this basically says that there's no breakthroughs in science required once the magnet works. And so, you know, you can look at this development pathway and say, if you're an LTS, you have, you know, basically have low field and large devices. And that's kind of the eater path right here. Um, if you open up the space with high magnetic field, you can actually go from a device like Alcator CMOD, uh, which we've already built and operated, to Spark which would be net energy from fusion to arc, which would be the first fusion power plant. And this is the scale of all of these devices. These, these are approximately to scale with ITER here up on the right. And so you can see kind of the dramatic difference in, in size of all of these devices. And so going back to our you know, sort of um, four quadrant plot, you, know, you always wanna live in the upper right of a four quadrant plot. And so this is where, this is where Spark would live, where you would take the high physical confidence from ITER but, and this is, these are all to scale, all these devices are to scale, you would be in sort of the class of devices of a startup where you'd have something that is fast and relatively small and relatively inexpensive. Um, and so we believe that we can build an entirely new energy industry based on the source. So we went out and we decided to make a new type of company in order to get the money to do this. Um, and in doing so, I think even more importantly, we sort of created a new model for fusion commercialization. So we knew from the get-go that we weren't gonna be able to, um, I mean, you guys are, are out close to Silicon Valley, um, you know, where you sort of, there's sort of the paradigm of like a couple people in a garage are able to start a company. You can't really do that with a fusion company because there's a lot of hardware required. You need a very, very large garage. Um, and you need a lot of very specialized expertise too. Um, and so we said, well, we, there's not, there isn't really a lot of government money going into this approach the you know the government is sort of um most of the government money in fusion goes into and magnetically confined fusion at least goes towards the eater path there wasn't like a lot of appetite to fund this at the time um, so we said we re we're really going to need to get private money to do this but we also want to re retain the very strong ties to academia i mean all the founders of cfs we all came out of the lab at mit um and you know we all all worked there in grad school um, and beyond uh, and said, you know, we, we don't, A, we don't want the lab to go away because the lab was, the funding was drying up for the lab. And we said it would be really dumb to shut this lab down for lack of money. Um, and B, there's this huge wealth of, of resources that we have, like literally in our backyard um, at the Plasma Science and Fusion Center that we can partner up with and, and do Spark, where CFS is a private company that's investor backed. It's just like a startup. Um, but we would find investors who are in it for the long haul. Um, so they're not in it, you know, to sort of make a quick buck and then turn around and, uh, and exit in a couple of years. And then we would have a really close partnership with the MIT Plasma Science and Fusion Center, which would remain an independent research establishment, but would have, would be doing research that we're sponsoring and kind of try to bring the best of both worlds together. And so we've sort of expanded from that as well. Um, and so, you know, collaboration and openness are kind of 
core to the values that we have. You know, we, the company was sort of was incubated in academia and we have very, very strong academic roots still. And so this is just, you know, we have over 50 collaborations going right now with over 40 institutions in, you know, in many, many different countries, you know, anywhere from universities to national labs. Um, there's several, uh, uh, there's several Infuse Awards that we have, which are basically uh, public, they're um, uh, sort of like SBIR level um, public-private partnership awards. There's RPE Awards, which are a bit bigger, sort of like million dollar class awards. Um, and, and yeah, it's been, uh, it's been really great to, uh, I can say personally, to be able to collaborate with all of these really, really talented researchers all over the world. Um, and actually, you know, personally as well, getting to travel to a lot of these places has been really great um, and, and see all of the, the work and contribute um, to all of the work that's being done in all these institutions with Fusion. So on the company side, you know, we wanted to build a really long uh, term program with a solid foundation. And so to date, we've raised about $250 million from what we call sort of serious people who are taking fusion seriously. Um, and in doing so with our partnership back to academia, we're leveraging about a billion dollars of existing infrastructure um, and expertise that exists at the Plasma Science and Fusion Center, not to mention all the collaborations around the world. Uh, so there's about uh, close to 300 now people working on the joint effort. Um, it's actually really cool to see the different talent pools that we're able to, uh, to bring in through these um, through this partnership as well, because, you know, MIT has been able to attract talent from academia and national labs and people who are more on like professor track or the research scientist track. And CFS has been able to bring in people from industry and high tech startups. So like SpaceX, Blue, Tesla, um, Hyperloop. Uh, a bunch of the car companies, actually, um, some aerospace companies. So it's really an interesting uh, and very diverse mix of backgrounds that we have working on this project right now, which I think is contributing to the success is that we have people from a whole bunch of, uh, you know, coming from a whole bunch of different types of technology. It's not just like a bunch of fusion plasma physicists, for example, those are very important, but that's one piece of the puzzle for the larger effort. Uh, we've been able to do that because of this sort of public private setup that we have. And um, this is really exciting, actually. So I mentioned, you know, we have some infused grants and some RPE grants, but actually sort of the next stage of that is there's a, you know, kind of hundred million dollar class milestone based development program that was passed into law through the Energy Act of 2020. Um, it still has to go through appropriations and all that. The fact that this even got through Congress was, I think, really, really interesting and a really good sign for the future. And so like the Infuse program, for example, is going to expand to allow partnerships with universities, which I think is really exciting uh, for places like Berkeley. Um, and then internationally too, you know, public private partnerships are, are scaling actually even faster than the US. So like the UK Atomic Energy Agency has committed over 500 million. Um, and there's actually companies like General Fusion that are North American that are sort of hopping across the pond to, to go to Britain. So there's, things are definitely heating up on the government side as well now too. Um, and so, you know, private industry and, and public programs and academia, I think, you know, from, from what we've seen in our experience with working with MIT and all of these partners, you know, the different, and, and Soren and I were actually just, you know, on a panel um, a few weeks ago talking about, uh, about how, you know, how these collaborations work. And I think one of, the, one of the key things is that the two different groups are good at two different things. Um, and, and by working together, you can basically have each group do what they're really, really good at um, and have a partnership with the other group. And it can be a very symbiotic relationship. Um, so that's been a really cool piece um, of, this whole, of this whole effort. So I wanted to end the talk with just some of the stuff that we've recently done um, that we think is pretty exciting. So recently, um, if you've seen news about CFS, we, we recently built and tested this revolutionary full-scale magnet. Um, so we call it the toroidal field model coil or the TFMC. Um, I think there's a couple of videos online of like the building of it and um, you know, how it goes together, but it's basically a whole bunch of pancakes. Actually, each of these pancakes is itself the, the largest um, uh, large, the largest HTS magnet ever made. We're putting 16 of these together into a big structural case. Here's like a picture of the forging. We, the, the case was a single piece forged bottom and a single piece forged top. Um, we loaded it with uh, 
about a factor of 10 more of this HTS tape that's ever been ordered before. Um, and that large order actually enabled us to scale up the industry to be able to supply us for Spark and beyond. Um, and then we put it into this magnet and we tested the magnet and the magnet, uh, the magnet worked. Uh, we, you know, here's a picture of us lowering the magnet into the big cryostat. Um, so here's, here's the magnet right here. Um, uh, and this is also actually just um, in, in the same lab that I'm in right now, a few hundred feet away um, in a big test cell. Um, uh, so we, you know, we put the magnet into the cryostat, we got it really cold, and then we pumped about 40 kiloamps, so 40,000 amps of current through this magnet while it was superconducting to generate a 20 Tesla field on this magnet. So you might, you might have looked before and say, well, you know, other people have built magnets that are, that are higher field than that, which is absolutely true and is very impressive. Um, you know, there's magnets now that are, you know, upwards of 30 Tesla um, that have HTS components in them. But I think the really important piece of this magnet is not only was it high field, um, but it was also very large bore. I mean, you can fit like a person through the bore of this magnet, which is really what you need to get fusion to work. You need a large bore magnet that can have the room to contain a plasma. And so, you know, the importance of HTS magnets has also been more and more established kind of in the government. So, um, you know, the, the DOE FESAC report on fusion in 2020 mentioned HTS, the, the National Academies of Science report on fusion that came out um, recently uh, had a whole bunch um, about uh, high, high temperature superconducting magnets and how important high field was. So I think the community is also getting really excited about this, which is really cool. Um, and so just to finish things up um, about kind of looking forward to the future. So we're planning on having a domestic, you know, U.S burning plasma by 2025. Um, so actually, we actually are investors. Um, uh, basically, we, we were able to raise some more money last year to acquire some land. So we have about 47 acres um, out in about an hour uh, west of um, in Devons of MIT. Um, and on that campus, we're going to start by building uh, on the left here, um, there's going to be a, a building that is our manufacturing facility and kind of the headquarters of CFS. Um, and then this building on the upper right here will be the tokamak call for Spark. And we plan on starting Spark operations in around 2025. And this is real. I mean, this is like, so here's a picture of the site as of a few weeks ago. And so this is the building on the upper right. Uh, so the, the perspective has changed a little, but the building on the upper right uh, is the, the magnet factory and headquarters. And then this building right here in the center is Spark. So it's really cool to see all of this coming together. And, you know, I get pictures every, every week um, of, of the site. It's moving extremely fast. This is actually out of date now. This is the, all the concrete has been poured um, and all of this. And they're starting to put up the, the walls around here. So it's really exciting to see all of this coming together. Um, so yeah, here's, here's, some more, here's some more pictures of, um, of all of the construction. And so, you know, there, here's sort of, just want to finish on sort of the path. So, you know, completed, you know, proven the science of Tokamax, Alcator CMOD was, you know, was our contribution to that um, uh, in sort of like the, the world fusion community. Um, in 2020, we published the physics basis for Spark that built, you know, it's kind of resting on the shoulders of all of the research that's come before it um, with, with CMOD and all of these Tokamax and ITER, the ITER physics basis. And then just recently, you know, a couple months ago, we demonstrated that the magnet technology works. Um, and so now the next step is to build the Spark device and turn it on in 2025 and get net energy from fusion. And then looking forward to the future and kind of the early 2030s, the plan would be to build ARC, which would be the first fusion power um, on the grid. And so it's all very exciting. And I think I will, I will stop the talk there and answer some questions from people. It's very exciting. Uh, thank you, Brandon. Uh, it's yeah. it's very cool that you show us. Uh, you know that your talk was started off with high temperature superconductors, and then you show us forging. So yeah. this is very exciting. <laughs> yeah, we've got lots of metal and concrete. You know things are real when you start pouring concrete and have big chunks of metal. It's great. It's great. Uh, I see some question, Timothy. Uh, yeah, Brandon. Great presentation. Um, thank you. Uh, does the spark reactor have a provision for helium ash removal or is that something that are you yep. what's yeah so the the way that they, yeah so the helium the way that you get rid of helium ash is um there's there's sort of two regions if you look at the let me actually i'll share my screen again it's easier to 
to explain this with a picture. Um, it's actually, it's so arc, arc is, it, you can kind of see it in Spark too, um, but arc is easier to see. Kind of these lobes on the top and bottom are what are called diverters, and you actually have an X point in your plasma. So basically, if you start with a, say you have a whole bunch of fusion reactions happening in the center of your plasma, your particles eventually make their way to the outside. They will eventually hit the separatrix here and be funneled into the diverter. And so in the diverter region, you'll basically neutralize the helium and just vacuum pump it out. So that's how, I mean, that's very high level, but that's effectively, you sort of have exhaust ports on the top and bottom. And you can kind of see that in Spark as well. Um, it's a little harder to see because the, the trying is a little busier, but there's diverter on the top and diverter on the bottom. Uh, so, so is that a passive mechanism besides the mm -hmm. vacuum pumping or is, that, yep. is it? A, yep. Wow, okay, very cool. Questions? I don't see the hands raised, if there are any. Soren's hand is raised. Oh, Soren, oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Brandon, thanks for the Sorry. beautiful, beautiful presentation. Um, so, you know, the, the, you've done already a, a huge lift with the, with the magnet. That's kudos, by the way, on that. Um, Thank you. And, yeah. and we're all counting on you to, uh, <laughs> although you'll be, you'll be, you know, siphoning all the production of Rebco uh, for, for years here. We're also hoping oh. that it drives the cost down, of course. And, uh, yeah, and the already has. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. But so can you just say a few words about the, the you know, there's still plenty of heavy lift ahead, right? I mean, the, the magnet, this mm -hmm. is one coil yeah. out of 16. You're going to have a lot more stored energy. Um, the yep. forces are going to be different. And, and then, um, yep. you know, protection of the magnets, et cetera, that there's still some, I'm sure, things to test and prove. Mm -hmm. And then how about the, uh, the first wall and, and some of the other elements of a tokamak that are yeah. not non-trivial? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so the... Yeah, so there's, there's a lot, uh, a lot in there. Um, yeah, there's definitely a lot of research to still do um, in. So I guess addressing the magnet technology. Um, so right now we're actually moving on to so the, the TF magnet, actually the TFMC did have a lot of representative stresses um, and it did not have exactly the same amount of stored energy as a spark as the entire toroidal set would. But on a coil basis, it actually has the same or very close to the same stored energy per unit volume. So the sort of dynamics of things like the quench and the stability and things like that were actually pretty similar between the TFMC and a Spark TF coil. Um, the next thing that we're actually going to be developing is um, the CSMC, the central solenoid model coil, uh, which, as you mentioned, that, that one's going to be so that's a pulsed coil, which means that we can't build it out of the same uh, the same technology that we built the TF out of. Um, that one's going to be cable based, insulated cable based, and um, that one will have to have quench detection and protection on it. And so, um, you know, you're, I, I know you're, you're, you're very familiar with, you know, we've, we've been working with you guys um, on different methodologies there. Um, I think that's going to be a big part of the next year um, for the central solenoid. Um, we actually have, uh, we have another sample on, on its way to Sultan right now, um, which is really exciting. So Sultan is the uh, facility. I had a, a picture of it that kind of flashed by on one of the slides. It's a facility in Switzerland that tests cables basically um, under very high loads. So there's, there's a sample that should hopefully be on a plane soon, if it isn't already, um, to be tested at the end of November. Uh, we're going to do, I think, a couple of those tests. And that one is going to be really dedicated. We have, um, we have a bunch of different quench detection systems uh, in, in, that, in those cables to, to basically you know, pressure test them. Um, as far as the, the first wall, um, we also have a development program going on right now. It's a couple of the collaborations that we have. There's one at, um, at Penn State. There's another at Oak Ridge. Um, where we're basically doing high heat flux testing of the sort of the, the armor tiles on the inside of the tokamak. So, you know, even though the plasma is relatively cold when it reaches, when it reaches the outside, you still, if you're focusing all of it in this diverter region, there is still quite a high heat flux that's incident on your tiles. And so, you know, there's strategies that we have to mitigate this. Um, like sweeping the strike point and the diverter across the tiles, but we actually want to do the, the material testing. So we're using like, for example, electron beams, like very high, high flux electron beams, high, high heat flux electron beams to scan over tiles. Okay. Thanks a lot, Brandon, and good luck. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We're rooting for Thanks you. Thanks for the help. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Peter. 
Hey, thanks for that talk. That was amazing. Gives me some optimism. Um, I had a question about the relationship between power density and land usage. I'm wondering if they scale linearly or, or if um, so there's some I, way to get of land. Yeah. So I don't know the number off the top of my head, um, but the yeah the power density and land usage is it, as a function of land usage is very um, I would say very high. Um, so basically, there's a lot of power with not a lot of land um, because you're effectively looking at the footprint of a you know you're looking at the footprint of a for example take a coal plant but then make that footprint smaller because you don't require all of the space to store all of that coal. You really just need, you need the, the space for the boiler, which you replace, you rip out the boiler, you put in a tokamak. Um, obviously I'm, I'm oversimplifying by a lot, but yeah, you rip out the boiler, you put in a tokamak, and then you have the balance of plants. So the turbine, the generator, and the switch yard that you have um, that would be producing the same or maybe even more power than the coal plant did. So that's kind of, I, unfortunately, I don't have, I, I don't have actual like, you know, megawatt per acre numbers off of the top of my head. Um, but it's, uh, it, uh, it's pretty high compared to high megawatts per acre compared to pretty much any other source of energy. Uh, th thanks, Brendan. Um, we, are all, we kind of have a little bit over time, but, but I, th I, see, I see Lee has a question and I have a quick question uh, to, uh, did you decide for you know, for the next project and after Spark uh, what the blanket is going to be? Is that <laughs> uh, we're very we're very very strongly considering FLIB, so fluorine, lithium, and beryllium salt. Um, and so we'd actually love to talk to you guys some more uh, about uh, about doing salt experiments. Um, uh, but it's I would say it's you know we're mostly there, um, but we're still open to other things. The decision hasn't been finalized yet. Okay, now follow up question. Why fly rather than the maybe more traditional eater lead lithium? Yeah, yeah. so um, the reason is that the, the lead lithium and eater isn't in a sort of like, we have like a liquid immersion blanket where it's basically just like, it's it's more of like a like molten salt reactor, like tub type. And in lead lithium, for example, you have MHD effects where if you're flowing this, you know, this liquid um, inside of a magnetic field, you can get quite a lot of turbulence, which makes pumping really hard. So, yep. yeah. Okay, very good, thanks. Uh, Lee, a uh, quick question maybe? Just two little technical questions. I think, yeah. by the way, this is really exciting. One of them, uh, really great. One of them is, did do you know what the, uh, how robust against fast neutrons, the high temperature um, superconducting magnets are? Is there some special issues that you have with, with them? And secondly, about BREM, do you have, because you've got a much higher field density and strength, your BREM straw lung is probably gonna scale up in some way. Have you guys looked into this and what does it, what are the effects? Yeah, so I guess I'll talk to the second one first because that one, the, so, yeah, we, we looked at the Brem straw lung. So I'm I'm less I, I did I did study plasma physics in grad school, but I would say I'm much more of a magnet scientist than a plasma physicist. Um, that we we did look at Brem straw lung in the physics basis. Um, so I guess I would I'm going to cop out a little bit and refer you to the the paper. Um, but it's not I guess the short answer um, at a high level is that we're not we're not that worried about Brem straw lung. Um, like if you follow like it, it is definitely. Um, it's definitely more of an effect, but it's not the, the winds that you get from the high field and confinement far outweigh that. Um, on the first question that you have, that's, that one is actually, um, that's actually what I did my thesis on in grad school. So uh, <laughs> I, I know a little bit about that. Um, and so the, uh, so we, we actually do know there's, there's people that have irradiated actually from in the, the, the research group in Vienna. Um, uh, yeah, they've, they've actually irradiated HTS with neutrons up to a certain level. Um, and we know that it survives up to a certain fluence. And we've picked, we've basically said, we're going to be conservative and pick that fluence in all of our designs right now going forward. But, um, that is, uh, basically 
that that's like a conservative lower limit. And so like my research and the research that's continuing on at MIT, um, you know, and at Berkeley um, is basically looking for upside and saying like, well, you didn't test it really to failure. <laughs> you tested it up to a certain level. Um, and so I think there's actually quite a lot of headroom to go based on sort of the early results and looking at the reaction kinematics at cold temperatures, because all the work that's been done so far um, with neutrons has been at sort of room temperature or higher than that. And of course, you know, the collision kinematics change quite a bit when you get down to the operating temperatures of the superconductor, um, you know, things like looking at diffusion of defects. Um, you know, if you're operating at 20 Kelvin, it's much different than if you're operating at, at 300 Kelvin. So I think it's a, it's a really, really interesting and, and still active area of research. But as far as our plant designs, we said, okay, we're, gonna, we're not gonna bank on that upside. And as a design strategy, we said, we're gonna take as much as we know that we can use from like conservative limits that already exist in the literature. And then if we find upside later, we'll incorporate that. Thank you. I see there's more questions. Unfortunately, I have to run to another class. So you're welcome to keep talking if I sign sure. somebody else being the, the host. Yeah, I can stay for a few more minutes. I'd, I'd be um, happy to address Lee, the... uh, is it okay if I send you over to, as a host? Sure. Right, if sure. I manage to do that uh, somehow. I'm not sure how to do that though. Uh, well, thanks again, Peter. It was really, thank, thank you for the, the invitation. And yeah, it's really great to give this talk. And hopefully I'll, I'll be able to see you in person sometime in the next few months. Yeah, no, absolutely. I also want to follow up on a few items. Uh, sure. Uh, if I figure out how to sign. Yeah. Okay, I will try this. Leave me. Oh, looks like we're still on. Yeah, that <laughs> worked. <laughs> yeah. Um, we didn't go into John, a black hole. John, John is. Uh, that's right. Or we're all there together. John, you're. Uh, you're. you're uh, I, I think I'm the host now. Oh, you're the host. There you go. Yeah, I was the co-host anyway, and, and it's okay. Great. John uh, Gooding had his hand up. Yeah, great talk. I just had a, uh, a question more about like the general future market. I was wondering mm -hmm. um, if, say, inertial confinement fusion were like the first to break even, do you think there's room for competing technologies or do you think there's a danger of sort of uh, it being like the first, you know, the first oh. winner takes all kind of thing? I, I feel like there's a lot of room. I think, you know, like I said at the beginning of the talk, I think even looking at other renewable technologies, I mean, this is now just like my personal opinion and not, you know, not the, not the views of, C, of CFS, although it kind of is that, you know, we, we really welcome all of the different types of renewables. Like, I mean, the whole reason we started a company to commercialize fusion was because of climate change. Uh, it's kind of like full stop. And so I think the more, the more things that are out there, the better. And you know, it's really, it's going to be a big lift no matter how we're doing it. And I think, I think at this point, you know, like the more, like the more the merrier. All right. Thank you. Yeah. I see there's a couple questions in the chat too. Can... Yeah. Why don't you go ahead and, and right. go for that? So I think the first one is from Ian Pong about superconductor QA, QC. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to talk about that. So um, yes, yeah, so that was a big, that was a big challenge, um, at, especially at the beginning of the program. Um, and so what we ended up doing is we ended up partnering with a, actually, um, on the, the slide that I had with like the map of the world, we actually, of all places, we, we ended up partnering with a lab in New Zealand um, called the Robinson Research Institute that built this really cool machine called a supercurrent, which was a um, semi-commercial HTS testing device that allows you to um, to basically mount a sample on a wand, put the wand in a small cryostat in a background magnetic field, and then kind of semi-autonomously do a whole bunch of measurements. You basically give it a batch file of like field temperature and field angle, and it will perform all these measurements, you know, without you having to sit there and program each one of them in. Um, and so we worked really closely with Robinson and we finally said, we should just buy our own machine. So we bought one machine um, and then we got another machine um, and so there's a whole team at CFS now actually that has built up the characterization technology from not just, so like, for example, like when I did my thesis research, I thought I was going really fast. I measured 40 samples in like six months. Um, and I was like, oh man, I was working like, you know, like 16 hour days in order to do that. Um, now, so we've measured, you know, close to 4,000 samples now. And at our facilities at CFS, we can go through like 10, 15 samples a day. Um, with the facilities that we currently have. 
And so we've, we've increased sort of just the physical throughput of samples. You know, we've tested thousands of samples now and have the, the capability to test many, many samples. But in addition to that, I think even more importantly, actually one of our scientists um, or, or uh, our engineers on staff just recently gave a talk at UCAS about this. Because we have all these statistics about the tape now, we are actually transitioning now to statistical methods because we actually have a data set of several thousand points that we can use to, you know, to actually get a statistically significant sampling size and say, okay, maybe we don't have to do 100% inspection. We can do like any other industry uses, like when you buy bolts, not every single bolt is QA, QC. There's, you know, there's lot inspections. And so we're kind of moving to that paradigm for tape, which is actually really exciting. It's kind of cool talking to people who've come in from our company from like aerospace or you know, the automotive industry who are very used to these, like, you know, there's like stand, you know, there's groups with standards and it's like, oh, we're like taking HTS. We're like writing our own standards for how to do statistical testing of HTS, which is kind of a cool paradigm to be in. Um, there's another follow on from Ian, Ian but um, Lorenzo had his hand, hand up. So why don't we give him a shot first? Thank you. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, I apologize, but I joined late. So you might have answered this question already. Uh, in your talk, but I was wondering if uh, you already plan for strategies for treating recycling. Uh, how is it going to work? And if there is going to be a periodical cleanup of the blanket, maybe this is a question that you'll ask yourself after Spark, but I would um, be very interested in having an answer to that. Thanks. Yeah, we're actually, we're starting to look at that right now. Um, so we have an active collaboration going um, with a group at Rochester, actually. Um, it's interesting, you know, someone mentioned laser fusion. Um, so the, you know, the laser fusion people or inertial confinement fusion people um, actually deal with tritium all the time. And actually the, the sort of the precursor to the National Ignition Facility, um, the Omega facility out in New York, um, has about as much tritium on site as Spark will. Um, and so they actually already have a lot of the recycling and processing systems in place that we can sort of, you know, modify to our usage for Spark. Um, so on that end, we're already working on sort of like the recycling. You actually only burn up about 1% of the fuel as it goes through the plasma. Um, you actually exhaust most of the fuel straight out of the vacuum. So you need to recycle that fuel. On the sort of blanket recycling of tritium, um, that is something that we're hoping, we have an RPE grant in the works right now that we're, we're looking to get, um, hopefully, um, uh, hopefully it'll get funded, we'll see. Um, uh, I think if it doesn't get funded, we're gonna end up figuring something else out. But we wanna build a, excuse me, we wanna build a device um, uh, that's, that's basically a, a prototypical blanket device where we, we have a vat of molten salt, um, probably fly. Um, that we put a, um, a DT accelerator driven neutron source. So a fusion neutron source with an accelerator and then breed tritium inside the blanket and then do a whole bunch of experiments on you know, corrosion and tritium extraction and you know, tritium permeation and things like that inside of this experiment. So that's something that we'd actually wanna do in parallel with Spark and kind of, you know, we're, we're out sort of raising, uh, raising funds right now and depending on how much we can raise, like, the idea would be to do as much of ARC in parallel that we can on the bench top while we're building Spark so that by the time that Spark is online, we'll actually have, uh, we'll have risk retired a lot of the subsystems on ARC before we actually go and build it. Thank you. I really look forward to see the, the results of these collaborations. Yeah, thanks. And, you know, in, in, especially in that area, we're really looking, you know, we're really looking for partners. So, um, yeah. Chris is next, I believe. Yeah. Hey, Renan, uh, hey. amazing talk um, as, as always. Um, my question revolved on the magnet itself that was tested um, for Spark. I know the plan for Arc is that the magnets would be like uh, demountable. Mm -hmm. um, are the magnets for Spark also gonna be demountable? And have you That's thought nice. about annealing studies? Um, as a sort of a counter to the effect of the fast neutrons. Um, can you talk on that? Yeah, yeah. so um, that was a big debate. That's a really good question. That was a, a very spirited debate that we had early on in, in the design of Spark. And ultimately we decided um, to not demount the coils in Spark. We said that would add you know, too much complexity for, um, for that device. 
um, and do it in parallel. So just like the blanket technology we'd be doing in parallel, um, we're going to have another development program where we actually build a separate demountable coil or probably coil set um, in parallel with Spark that isn't installed on Spark, but is something that we would treat as if it were a demountable set on an arc. Um, so yeah, so we're, we're, we sort of actively have been developing that technology on the bench top. And we actually like for the Sultan test, for example, um, we have joints on the Sultan test that have been demounted and remounted many times on the cables. Um, so we sort of have that on a bench top scale, but obviously, you know, it's not, you can't just have the joint. You need to have the whole magnet and the whole system be able to take itself apart. And so that would be, you know, over the next couple of years, I think, um, we're planning on building, um, building a full scale coil that would demount. Um, that's the, this is the, the Viper cables. Um, I see, mm -hmm. um, yeah. 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 Zach, uh, Zach's at the at the helm. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I, I so it's funny. Uh, the, um, Zach's the Zach is actually like the person that got me into this whole fusion thing. Uh, way oh, that's before. awesome. Yeah, <laughs> I interned with Dennis, and I went across the hall from Zach, and so he would like you know he's a he's a good mentor. Yeah, give him my yeah respect. yeah okay. definitely yeah thank you. Um, and really quick to answer your question on annealing, um, we are looking, so yeah, so Alexi and, and David, I think actually are looking at annealing effects um, um, for the magnets for the radiation damage. Um, so that's something, something we're looking into. Again, we're not gonna bank on it, um, but it's definitely, it's definitely an interesting prospect. Yeah, no, he, he tells me, uh, yeah, yes, he's, we've been in, we've been in touch. Um, we, we've been, uh, <laughs> um, you are the person that actually put us in touch um several months back um, yeah in a kind of roundabout way and i know he's interested in like the positron sort of capabilities of um of peter's group yeah it's it's exciting okay very cool yeah, yeah. reed has a question next yeah so congratulations uh, uh the Thank next you. test is a big big deal um i'm sorry <laughs> if i miss it i'm sure there's details but i would love to know more about it um can you comment on like the cable that was used or are you guys gonna you know, uh, on this or... yeah, so we are, we're currently, unfortunately, I can't say too much about that right now um, because people are in the process of like writing stuff up to publish. Um, okay. So that's one thing I, I can't talk too much about, um, but it, you know, it's based off of the technology that we developed in the first few years. It's actually not a cable based, like not strictly a Viper cable based magnet. It's a, a different technology, but they're in process of writing it up. So I don't want to steal somebody's thunder. Gotcha. Okay, thanks for sharing. Last, you mentioned that you're doing a, a like a model solenoid, and that will be cable based. Mm -hmm. Yep, that one will be cable based. Yeah, so that that will be using kind of a variant of a Viper that we've developed um, that we think will perform really well in an AC pulsed mode, because the central solenoid is basically going to have crazy, you know, like kind of like several Tesla per second flux swings on it, and so um, generally superconductors don't like that. <laughs> Um, but we think we found a configuration of Viper um, that is that will survive that. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, just one other thing I noticed that Ian had, um, Ian Pong had uh, a question. Um, follow up, following up on uh, the early, uh, earlier question, are the data CFS collected on the tape published or do you intend to publish them for everyone to use? Um, some of them are. So there's actually, we have a paper out with um, one of our suppliers. Um, so Superox um, is, is one of the, the many suppliers that provide us with tape. And so we published, oof, I think now it's like almost, almost a year maybe, um, a, a paper in Nature with them and uh, Nature Science Report or Nature Scientific Reports um, that is uh, also open access. Um, uh, Trying to think of, I don't know the best way to, to get, get you a link to that paper, but there's a whole bunch of high field data. Um, we did testing at Tohoku in Japan, which has a 25 Tesla magnet. Uh, we did testing in, um, so Carmine Senatore's group in Switzerland um, uh, did, did some testing for us. And also, um, I think, uh, I'm blanking now, I think that, that Superox actually was able to get a couple tests done at the high field magnet lab as well. In addition to, you know, we have several hundred data points from our 12 Tesla system uh, at, uh, at CFS. So yeah, there is uh, a lot of the data has been published. 
Great. All right, folks. So um, we're now we're 21 minutes past the hour, and I think it's probably time. There's certainly a lot of enthusiastic interest for your work, Brandon. Um, thank you very much on you know for coming yeah, here absolutely. and making these discussions. And I think we all wish you a lot of success in the in the time to come. So um, with that, yeah. Thank you very much. My pleasure. All right, everyone. Have a great weekend. Okay. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Thanks.